Hello, I'm Andy Briggs and welcome to The Amazing Astronomical Alphabet, a weekly programme in which my Astro Radio co-presenter Daz and I will be talking about anything astronomy related which begins with the week's letter of the alphabet. We'll each choose some things to talk about which are in some way related to the universe, but neither of us will know what the other has chosen. We will then reveal facts about them which are weird, strange, bizarre or simply interesting. Well, hello listeners and welcome back to the uh, amazing Astronomical Alphabet with me, Andy, and uh, my esteemed co-presenter, Daz, who's just got back off holiday. How was it, Daz? It was beautiful. Um, The weather was fine. The uh, hotel was fantastic. Food, oh, to die for. Um, yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, that's, just that's not bad for Scunthorpe, is it? <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, Pogna Regis. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, um, yeah, because I went to Lanzarote. Um, we decided we we're going to bite the bullet. And the only thing, the fly in the ointment was all the uh, BS that went with it, trying to get all our tests and uh, oh, track yeah, and trace form sorted out. So, And the worst thing was, and I'll say this on air, is that we came back through Birmingham Airport and we weren't asked once for our track and trace details, which we were com- we which we were told we wouldn't get back in the country without. So it's all a load of BS, I'm afraid. So yeah, I can That's imagine, Mr. Angry, Mr. Angry. <laughs> well, I, I've got this to, this pleasure to come twice yeah. over the next two weeks because because next uh, next Friday I fly to Ireland and, uh, for <laughs> six days and then I'm back for a week and then I'm off to to Wales for. Four days, so uh, I've got all these joys of, of COVID bureaucracy to come. And it keeps changing, and no two websites give you the same information. And uh, a lot of the websites haven't been updated in ages, and trying to get a definitive answer, what do I need to do and when do I need to do it, is impossible. Yeah. So what I'm going to do on Monday, probably, is to ring the British consulate in Barcelona and, uh, and ask them. You because think they'll know? <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> Yes, I do. I do, because um, they've always been on the ball about everything. I've, I, I've spoken to them before and they're so helpful and they know, you know, things that you wouldn't find anywhere yeah, else. So, yeah. so it's yeah. a job to really, isn't it? Yeah, but um, I forgot what I was going to say then. Uh, yeah, so, but uh, yeah, because what I found is when we were going through, as you said, on the Internet, is that nothing had been updated for a long, long time. Oh, that's and right. What you needed to know was right at the very bottom. They'd add a footnote. Yes. And so you go through all this stuff. So, well, I can't wait. no, they've changed that. They've changed that. And then you go right to the variant. Oh, that's what we need to know. Yeah. So, and, uh, and you also yeah. go on, on um, a web paper trail because you click one yeah. link and then it says, right, click here and you click that and then click that and you end up back where you started. You <laughs> that's right. You go circles. right in circles. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, we've got it sus, mate. We, got it. we don't want anyone coming in or going <laughs> out. <laughs> Uh, there we are then okay dear listeners we um we have reached the uh incredible heights of the letter q in our journey through the amazing astronomical alphabet but as there aren't that many astronomical terms or universe related things beginning with the letter q we might spill over into the unexplored territories of the letter r today so there's a bit of excitement for you uh so we'll see how we go but uh, we may start R, and next week we'll we'll finish off uh, with R. So I believe, Daz, it's my turn to go first this week. It certainly R. is. It certainly right. is. Okay. Yeah. Now, that, that gives me an advantage, of course, because I'm obviously going to come up with the most obvious astronomical phenomenon beginning with the letter Q. So Q is for quasar. And... Um, okay. And um, never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might have, you might actually know it under a different name because it's had three uh, three names um, in its time. First of all, they were called radio stars, and then they were called um, what led to the acronym Quasar, which is quasi stellar radio objects. And then they dropped the radio out of that because some quasars are radio quiet, so they're now known at the moment, as a QSO, a quasi-stellar object, which covers anything that looks like a star but isn't. So that is uh, where we're at at the moment. So what are they? Basically, quasars are objects towards the edge of the known universe, and therefore we're seeing them back in time. And they are between 600 million and about 30 billion light years away. And as I said, they are objects from the early universe and they are young galaxies. They are the cause of young galaxies that contain a supermassive black hole that consumes matter at a prodigious rate. 
And because of this, that matter as it's being swallowed by the black hole is heated up to millions of degrees and generates incredible amounts of radiation that we detect from the other side of the universe. Or if you want to put it another way, that we detect billions of years later. So uh, it, a quasar, it's a type of AGN, which stands for active galactic nucleus. And we talked about that before, didn't we, Daz, on this yeah, program? Yeah. And the supermassive black holes at the, um, the middles of quasars, these young galactic cores, they can have millions to tens of billions of times the mass of the sun. Now, this means that the most powerful quasars are thousands of times brighter in whatever wavelength of radiation than um, Milky Way galaxy. So they are really beacons that can be seen right across uh, space. And these black holes obviously are incredibly powerful. Now, we know of more than a million quasars. The closest known is about 600 million light years from the Earth. And um, the, the, uh, the furthest known quasar what means the radiation emitted from it uh, was emitted when the universe was only about 700 million years old. So very early on in the universe's history. And that um, oldest one, um, so the youngest one, it has a mass 1.5 billion times the mass of our sun. <laughs> So again, we're coming back to the question that we keep finding in under all sorts of contexts. How did these supermassive black holes grow that big so soon after the, the Big Bang? <coughs> Excuse me. Now, very simply, we don't know the, the answer to that. And um, when you look at the facts and the figures, quasars are really... Um, incredibly powerful. The typical quasar has a luminosity um, of 10 to the power of 40 uh, watts, which is, uh, which is a, a huge amount. And to be that powerful, to be that bright, a supermassive black hole would have to consume the equivalent of 10 solar masses of material per year. Now, if you can imagine our sun, which is, uh, you know, not far short of a million miles across, 10 of those per year will be required to, um, to um, power the average one. But the brightest known quasars, the, the brightest known quasar, um, actually devours a thousand solar masses of material every year. So if you can imagine that amount of mass, a thousand times the mass of our sun every year, and that means that it has to consume matter equivalent to 10 of our Earths every second, which, uh, which is a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal amount of material. Now, the, quasar, the discovery of the quasars, uh, very, very straightforwardly, they were discovered by Martin Schmidt and Alan R. Sandage in 1963 and 1964. They thought they were looking at stars because they were these objects that looked like stars. But when they measured their, when they took their spectrums, measured their redshift, they turned out to be towards the end of the known universe. And of course, if it looks like a star and it's towards the edge of the known universe, that means automatically that it's incredibly bright. So um, there are lots of different types of them, in fact. And I'll just go through some of the, the types of quasars that we have. So first of all, we have what are called radio loud quasars which are strong sources of, uh, believe it or not, radio emissions. And they're about 10% of the overall quasar population. Then we have radio quiet quasars, which are the opposite, which means they radiate at other wavelengths, but they're quite quiet at the uh, at radio wavelengths. Um, uh, and this accounts actually for the vast majority of quasars. About 90% of all quasars are radio quiet. This is the main reason why they dropped their designation from being quasi stellar radio object to just quasi stellar object, because 90% of them aren't radio objects. They're, they're, not, they're not active in radio wavelengths at all. And then you've got the BAL quasars, B A L. Um, these are quasars where they have um, blue shifts in their absorption lines. And what this means is that we are seeing gas being ejected from the center of the quasar towards us, and hence it's blue shifted 
rather than redshift is a, if it, uh, as it would be if it were traveling away from us. Uh, and these again are about 10% of quasars. And then you've got type two quasars. Uh, these are where you've got a quasar whose main uh, spectrum is being obscured by clouds of gas and dust. So that, that's like looking at a galaxy with a dark dust lane in it, if you like. So that's what we're talking about there. Uh, then we've got red quasars that are, believe it or not, redder than normal. And again, this is thought to be due to, to levels of dust. And uh, lastly, um, you've got um, a type of quasar called optical, optically violent variable quasars. And this is where you've got a jet, which we're familiar with in all sorts of contexts with supermassive black holes, being a jet being uh, ejected right towards the observer. And uh, relativistic beaming, which is something that Einstein predicted, where material traveling towards you is brighter than material traveling away, means that um, these jets vary, excuse me, in brightness. And because of this, uh, these quasars, which are optically violent variable, or OVV for short, uh, OVV quasars are also considered to be a type of blazar, uh, which, yeah. we, which we talked about. So um, there you are. And uh, just one more weak emission line quasars are quasars where they've got unusually faint emission lines in the ultraviolet and visible spectrum. The main uh, unifying feature of quasars is that um, most of them do emit strong amounts of ultraviolet light. So they are mainly ultraviolet objects. Uh, and there you have it. That's, that's our brief look yeah. at quasars. Because uh, um, I can't remember, I, it may, we may have cut it, but I, I did talk about OVVs uh, over um, violent uh, uh, quasars um, uh, when we did O. I don't know whether we actually went out. I think we may have had to cut it. But yeah. also one of the um, anom anomalies that actually appears with one of those is because they are so energetic and so rapid, they, they sort of seem, the, the radio waves pulse. But right. what it appears, and of course they're pulsing along the beam, mm. but it appears that the pulses are traveling faster, faster than light. That's right. Faster than light. That's and of course right. it can't. Um, but it's, an, it's sort of like, an, I was going to say an optical illusion, but it's not. It's a, ra a it's radio, radio illusion, illusion. <laughs> that makes it appear that these these pulses are moving faster than the, the speed of light. And uh, yeah, it's very, very, very strange things. Um Absolutely. And uh, yes, they, as you said, the blazars. Nice, isn't it? Nice name. Now, it's blazars. funny um, that I should have been looking into this uh, this week because there was something really interesting uh, released this week. Oh. It's to do with Gaia data, data from Europe's Gaia satellite, which has been patiently mapping a billion stars in the Milky Way in finer much finer precision than ever was possible before. And it's turned out some interesting things about the future of the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy and M33 and the Large Magellanic Cloud. Because it turns out that the collision between our galaxy and Andromeda is going to happen about 600 million years before we thought it was going to happen, 600 million years earlier than was previously thought. After the Milky Way and Andromeda have merged, M33, the triangulum galaxy, will also pile in. So it'll be a three galaxy bunk up, if you like. And, um, but that's not the most interesting. Long before that happens, the large Magellanic cloud is going to plunge into the Milky Way. This is going to happen about two and a half billion years from now. But most of its material is going to go into the galactic bulge because they've worked out where it's going to impact. Mm -hmm. That means it's falling down directly onto the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, whose mass will increase from 4 million times the size of the sun to 30 million times the mass of our oh, sun. Okay. And do you know what that will cause our galaxy to do? It will turn our galaxy into a quasar. Into a quasar, yeah. So our galaxy... Mm. Now, quasars you normally associate with, with young galaxies, and, and we think that all, you know, spiral galaxies especially, uh, all spiral galaxies go through a quasar, quasar phase in their youth. But this is, a you know, our galaxy, which is now 
you know, 13 billion years old, give or take, going into a quasar phase for the second time. So this could mean that distant ob observers, extraterrestrial civilizations, might look at our galaxy and say, oh, that's a really young galaxy because it's in a quasar mm. phase. Um, and the fact that our galaxy is going to turn back into a quasar is going to have ramifications for, you know, the whole future of the galaxy until it exactly. collides with Andromeda and, and even afterwards. So this is, uh, this is fascinating stuff. Yeah, I, I hadn't realized before that galaxies could go through more than one phase of being. No, I, I never re realized that. They could no. go through the quasar stage more than once. Interesting, um, isn't it? That's fascinating, yeah. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Because of course that's how I'm, I'm assuming that we're ass assuming now that that's how quasars are made with uh, merges um, and things uh, along that no, line. No, no, this is this and... this would be a very much a special case because um, you know quasars are powered by a supermassive black hole just consuming mm. uh, the material that is yeah. left over from the the formation of the galaxy at the center. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this is a special case of a galaxy reaching middle age and then having more mass added to the supermassive black hole, which, if you like, reignites it and turns our galaxy back into this incredible generator yeah. of energy called a quasar. Well, of course, it won't bother us, will it? Um, no. Because uh, <laughs> we won't be here. No. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, oh, so I reckon that would be a fascinating thing to see and to yeah. witness. But uh, yeah, as you said, somewhere hopefully another civilization somewhere will be looking and say, "Oh, yeah, it's a young galaxy." Yeah, there you go. Yeah. But the because, other thing, uh, the other thing was about it that um, they've also worked out that our galaxy and M thirty one they're not going to collide face on. No. And, uh, Andromeda is going to hit us more or less edge on, which means it'll give us a few glancing blows, uh, and then you know the merger will take place, but it will happen over millions of years. Mm. Galactic mergers don't happen overnight. Because there'll be a spiral dance sort of thing going yeah, on. Yeah, that's almost right. Like, almost that. like two flamenco dancers dancing around. Yeah, yeah. Way. And if you look at the, the, the computer simulations of this, it's all very graceful, actually. It's exactly like yes. two dancers. Yeah. You know. I, mean, if, I mean, as I said before, I don't like the word collision. No, no, it's that not. sounds like two There's things. Nothing much will collide. Yeah. It's, it's a merger. Nothing, uh, if anything does bump into each other, it'll be very, very unlucky. Yeah, absolutely. because you've got to think. I mean, this is where this is where the, the confusion lies. It's it's hard to imagine the gaps between all these objects. Absolutely. Um, uh, as you, I think you were talking about um, not meteors, but uh, the the asteroids. Yeah, uh, the asteroid belt. Um, everybody sees it as a complete dense of solid wall right. of That's stone, but they're you know, they're hundreds and hundreds of uh, miles apart um, and you can't even see each, uh, the, each no, other. No, you can't see one but, from the um, other. So, so, yeah, because, yeah. I mean, hopefully James Webb might be able to answer some of these questions, fingers crossed that everything goes well with it. Well, yes, um, absolutely, because it will because be that's going to be able to end. see back, you know, far enough that hopefully we, we might may give us some astonishing answers. And I think it's going to show us a lot of things that we thought, well, what the hell's that? You know, well, where did that come from? What is it? Right. What is, you know? Exactly. And yeah. uh, th this is always, you know, every time a new technology has been invented, which is effectively what James Webb is, because it's a large um, infrared telescope, the, the size of which has never been trained on the sky before. Mm. Every time we've had a, a change in technology, we've discovered momentous things in astronomy. And, and this, this time will be no different. You know, yeah. we'll, we'll see things that we didn't even know were there, and we'll see things that we haven't got a clue what they are but that is the wonder of it and that is how yeah. how we progress that's how our knowledge yeah, scratching progress. our heads isn't it exactly. because i mean you were talking about um, gravitational waves here we well mm. of course the australians have come up with a new way of detecting them yes with a, a tiny detector uh, with a little little um sort of like crystal yeah uh, detector thing and they reckon they've recorded um gravitational waves from the beginning of the uh, the universe so indeed uh, so, indeed so. They, they've just... recorded them twice they've recorded the same signal twice each time lasting for two minutes which mm. tells you immediately that if it is a gravitational wave event it's not a black hole merger and it's not a neutron yeah. star collision whether it's equipment noise or whether it's the uh, because you know these the detectors cool down to near enough absolute zero whether it's behaved differently thermally than they thought it was going to and it's generating a spurious signal it doesn't matter because there are many yeah. more detectors of that design um, coming online shortly. So we'll find yeah. out. 
because if it Fantastic. does, um, if it does spot it, you know, um, then then if they get the same signal from another detector, that would be really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Because if we have gravitational wave signals from effectively the beginning of time, give or take a few squillionths of a second, then uh, that is going to be so exciting. So exciting. A experiment that we I'd like to try with you. Really? A Q is for Quindar. Do you Quindar? know what Quindar? Yeah, Quindar. No. Or should I say Quindar tones? Does that make it any easier? Was that a punk rock group in the 1970s? Yeah, they are brilliant. They were. Yeah, yeah. 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 What sort of experiment Same are you going to do on me? Last time I couldn't walk for weeks afterwards. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I told you not to move, but you did. Oh, well, you know, um, okay, okay, but um, no, Quindar tones. Mm -hmm. And I will actually uh, just give me a second. I will just actually show you what they are. You, I, I'm, I'll tell you, everybody will know immediately what these are. And just give me a second. I'll play it a couple of times because it's uh, quite short. Okay. Uh, here we go. Oh. Right. I hope you heard those, everybody. Is, um, that, a heart? Is that your heart monitor, Daz? <laughs> no, because that's flatline. <laughs> um, yeah. You've uh, heard of the living dead. Well, yeah. Exactly. Um, these quindars are the tones, the bleeps that you get on radio transmissions in space. Ah. From um, and basically what they yeah. Mean how are you spelling that, that, by the way, quindar? Q U I N D A R. As it quindar sounds. Tones, yeah. Quindar. Yeah, right. as it sounds. Okay. Um, and as you could, if for those of you who, uh, and for those of you with really good hearing, you probably noticed that both the 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 beat was repeated. They were a slightly different tone. And there, there is a reason for that. So what I'll do is I'll just read you what they say about this. So okay. we've all heard them with the Apollo recordings, um, even up to when the, the space shuttle, they were still using them when the space shuttle was around. Uh, so Quindar tones most often referred to as the beeps that were heard during American Apollo space missions right. were a means by which remote transmitters on Earth were turned on and off so that the capsule communicator Capcom hmm. could communicate with the crews of the spacecraft. Hmm. It was a means of in-band signaling to simulate the action of the push to talk and release to listen um, button commonly found on two-way radio systems right. uh, and walkie-talkies, often referred to as PTT, push to talk. Right. Um, so what was the rationale behind these? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, when Mission Control in Houston, Texas, wanted to talk to astronauts, the capsule communicator, Capcom, mm. pushed a button, pushed to talk, as we said, um, that turned on the transmitter, then spoke. He then released the button. When the transmitter is local, this is an easy, easy way to, this is easy to arrange. The transmitter is connected directly to the P P PTT button, push to talk button. Right. But to stay in continuous contact with the astronauts as they orbited Earth or traveled to the moon, NASA had to use tracking stations all around the world, switching from one station to the next as needed. To get the voice signal to the remote transmitter, dedicated phone lines connected these stations to Houston. NASA could either build a parallel system for operating the transmitters, one line to carry the audio, and another to carry the control signal for the PTT button. Right. Uh, or out of band, so called out of band signaling. Or combine these two systems together using radio tones to turn the transmitter on and off. Since dedicated phone lines were a very expensive measure at the time, NASA chose to, uh, the use of the tones to reduce the operating cost of the network. I... The same system was used in Project Gemini and was still in use with, uh, with half-duplex UHF space shuttle communications for transmitter radio frequency keying. Um, Quindar tones are no longer necessary because a single communication line can simultaneously carry multiple communication channels right. in the form of data comp um, comprising of both speech and signaling the PTT signal, as well as video and telemetry. 
However, Quindar tones can still be heard in missions like Crew-1 when the astronauts communicate with mission control. It's basically the, 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 Quind, the name Quindar came from the manufacturer. It was Quindar Electronics who used nice. the two tones. Um, I was going to ask you where the name came from, yeah. Yeah, uh, the intro, and as I said, if you, if for those with good hearing and we're able to hear it, um, the, there was two tones mm -hmm. of slightly different frequency. The intro tone was generated at 2,525 hertz mm -hmm. and signaled the key down or key press yeah. of the uh, uh, push to talk button and unmuted the audio. The outro tone was slightly lower at 2,475 hertz and signaled the release of the button and muted the audio. The two tones were generated by special equipment located at Mission Control, and they were decoded by detectors located at the various tracking stations. Wow. Um, now, there are, there are some um, misconceptions. If, if you just sort of, As I said, this was all at Mission Control. Yeah. But a lot of people seem to think that um, the, Qu the Quindar tones came from both Earth and from the astronauts in their ca uh, capsules. No, so no. When the when the when the astronauts um, transmitted, they would hear the tone as well. Uh, this confusion exists because many ground to space transmissions were instant in initiated by mission control mm. and responded to by the astronauts. So all the bleeps were coming from mission control. Why? Um, uh, another misconception about Quindar tones is that they are, were designed to signal the end of a transmission mission similar to a courtesy tone used on many half duplex radio repeaters. Um, although the astronauts may have secondary used used the Quindar outro tone to know when the Capcom uh, and had started and stopped speaking. So that's basically what it is. When you listen to the, the, the beeps, you now know that they are the, the Quindars. Quindars. Um, well, I never knew that. I mean, I knew, I knew the beeps were there, and I think I had a vague idea of what they're, what they're for. Um, but, uh, but I didn't know that they were called Quindars. Yeah, they, they were basically to um, wake up the transmitters, from, um, uh, from which were based all around the world, to mm. know that it's a message would, would basically turn them on so that they could transmit to the capsule in space, um, no matter where it was, or if it was traveling to the moon and back. So, so they, um, might have really taken, yeah, they might have taken that one step further, because if you're turning on all the trans, you don't need all the transmitters on, you only no, need you just one. turn on the one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so they could have encoded it further to switch on particular transmitters with particular tones. Yeah. Um, rather than switch yeah. them all on. You know, so basically, they did it for cheapness. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could send Absolutely. just send the tone down to, and of course, each telephone line went to each individual thing, so it wouldn't have uh, interrupted anybody else. Um, no, no. Absolutely. When they were using a transmitter in Australia, it just turned on that one transmitter, and they could communicate um, mm. through that. So that that is a quindar. I hope you enjoyed that. I did. Nice that was most interesting. Stuff. Most interesting. Yeah. We've got beeps. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the beeps. The beeps. <laughs> Um, we're going to move further afield from the Earth now, or for, even from the Moon. Uh, we're going to move to the icy depths of the solar system, out to that fourth zone of the solar system, which we know as the Kuiper Belt. Uh, the inner terrestrial planets, the gas giants, the ice giants, and then the Kuiper Belt being the four zones of our solar system. And in that Kuiper Belt, there's an object which is about half the diameter of Pluto. It was discovered. Uh, in uh, June 2002, and it was named Quaor, Q-U-A-O-A-R. Now, Quaor, um, it's about, as I said, it's six, about 697 miles or 1,121 kilometers in diameter. So that makes it about half the size of Pluto. American astronomers Tr uh, Chad Trujillo and Michael Brown found it at Palomar Observatory on the 4th of June, 2002. Well, that's where they were. I didn't mean they found it in the observatory because obviously it wasn't there. It was in the Kuiper Belt, <laughs> but they were there. The bin. Yeah, the and, bin. Uh, and they found it. It's since uh, been found that there were signs of water ice on its surface, which could mean that there are cryovolcanoes in operation. Ooh. 
but uh, that also on its surface are small amounts of uh, methane. Um, and methane is found only on larger Kuiper belt objects. The smaller ones just don't have enough gravity to retain methane. Um, so, um, so it's funny that, um, um, you know, that, that was a pretty major discovery. And the discovery of, of Kwa'or and objects like it, like Eris and the others, was indirectly what led to Pluto being demoted as a planet in 2006, because these objects are comparable sizes to Pluto. And therefore, at least part of the argument was, well, look, if, if Pluto is a planet, then all these objects in the Kuiper belt also have to be planets. So it's not clear cut. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever you think about the decision to demote Pluto as a planet, and we have talked about this at length before, uh, the discovery of Qua or Eris and others in the Kuiper belt. Eris in particular initially was thought to be larger than Pluto, but then it turned out that the measurements weren't quite correct. And it was a, it's a tiny bit smaller than Pluto. But this is what really kicked the debate into overdrive, the fact that we've found objects in the solar system comparable to Pluto that aren't planets. And if they're not planets, Pluto can't be a planet either. Or vice versa, if, if, if Pluto is a planet, we've got to make them planets as well and end up with poten potentially hundreds of planets in the solar system, which is no good, uh, really. So um, interestingly... Kwa'or has a moon. It has a moon. It was discovered in 2007, February 2007. And the moon was named Way What? And, uh, yeah, and, uh, and it's a synchronous moon. In other words, it always keeps the same side facing Kwa'or. And uh, it was discovered in 2007, as I said. So uh, it was discovered by Michael Brown, who had been one of the co-discoverers of, of Kwa'or. And it's measured at about 110 miles across. So it's quite a sizable moon. That's so about 170 kilometers. Now, if you're wondering where the name comes from, both Kwa Or and Waywat uh, are from mythological figures from the Native American Tongva people in Southern California. And in their legends, Kwa Or is the, uh, the creator deity and uh, Waywat is, is his son. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there you are. So yet again, it was a surprise to find such a large object in the Kuiper Belt. And don't forget, it was only really in the sort of the mid '90s that uh, Kuiper Belt objects were discovered at all. Although this type of zone has long been predicted, but we forget how you know comparatively recently Kuiper Belt objects are being discovered. Meaning now, you know, we know of, of hundreds of Kuiper Belt objects orbiting in this, this zone so far from the sun that the sun is just a bright star in the sky. And uh, these are all predominantly icy objects. And, uh, you know, Pluto is, is a Kuiper Belt object. It just happens to be about the, cl the closest mm -hmm. Kuiper Belt object that we know, but we must classify it as a Kuiper Belt object. And I fully understand why it lost its, its uh, status as a planet. Um, although, you know, not necessarily agreeing with the way it was done. But I think the problem is, you see, Daz, that when we go out into other star systems, well, not when we go, but when we look at other star systems, mm. we're finding such a bewildering variety of different types of planets there that we need a good classification system for yeah. planets. And because our solar system is highly unlikely to be typical, in fact, we know it's not, uh, we have to be prepared for weird configurations uh, and, and nature of, of planets. So a good classification system is needed. And uh, so, you know, ours won't be the only solar system with a belt of icy material far from the star. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. So we need to start classifying these objects properly, you know, because that's what we do. We, we can't make progress understanding anything unless we have good classifications for it and we can put it with others in its classification and study them together. So this is why we need a, you know, a decent cataloging system for planets. Um, but there you are. So that was quite a denizen of the Kuiper Belt. And we, we don't have really any good photos of it. You know, it's just basically a point of light. Mm. Even if you, if you enlarge it till it's heavily pixelated, you don't really see much, except that you do see its moon, Waywatch. 
Uh, you can see that with the, the, the Hubble Space Telescope can see Weiwat orbiting uh, Kwa'or, but it's heavily pixelated and uh, not showing any detail at all. So it's going to be a long time till we know anything about Kwa'or, uh, anything more than we already do, which is minimal. But there we are. So congratulations to... Um, to uh, Chad Trujillo and uh, Michael Brown for discovering Quao. Yes, exactly. Well done, chaps. Well done, chaps. Some are so small. And to actually find that it's also got a moon of its own. Yeah. So uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's like you say, we're finding all of these uh, quite large objects that are circling around. Um, there's even talk about they found planet uh, nine again. Again. Or... Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh Yes, yeah, so it's often quite often things that uh, need to be analysed, and uh, as you said, we need to be able to classify every, these things now. Sure. Um, because, uh, as you said, when we look at uh, other solar systems around other stars, um, some of these uh, planets are quite exotic. Extremely exotic. <clears throat> and also, they're in places where they shouldn't be mm, in theory. Indeed. So, uh, yes, it's. Um, but then again, when our solar system started, things weren't where uh, weren't where they are now. Uh, Jupiter went on a grand tour, so did uh, some of the bigger gi uh, gas giants. Yes. And they messed things up and viewed and, and rejigged. Eventually, we settled with what we've got now. So it, it's, it works for us. Um, but of course, we've sent messages out to, on discs and signals out so, and trying to tell people where we are. Mm. And it says we've got nine planets, and they're going to wonder, well, hang on, mate, we've come here. <laughs> they say they've only got eight. What's wrong with them? They can't but, even uh, count properly. No, exactly. <laughs> Not worth a yeah. visit. They can't even count. Yeah, Here's us with our advanced level of mass, and this lot can't even count properly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're a disgrace yeah. to the galaxy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> to the universe. The yeah. universe. Yeah. Can't even yeah. count up to nine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so they're, they're, they're bacteria of the... Uh, of the uh, universe quorum sensing oh my goodness right? that is q u o r u m sensing this this is already beginning to sound like hippie bollocks yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well i suppose you could <laughs> right in, no, on, in like it's, me, it's like a bio, it's a biological term oh, right. and it's in biology quorum sensing or quorum signaling is the ability to detect and respond to cell population density by gene regulation. As one example, Q, uh, qu bom, quorum sensing enables bacteria to restrict the, the expression of specific genes to the high cell densities at which the resulting ph uh, phenotypes will be most beneficial. Uh, many species of bacteria use quorum sensing to coordinate gene expression according to the density of their local population. Right. In a similar fashion, some social insects use, insects use quorum sensing to determine where to nest. Um, quorum sensing may also be useful for cancer cell communications. I don't think that's useful. No. Um, now, you're probably asking me why... Why am I talking about it? Yeah, says, in addition, about this? <laughs> uh, I don't know, Andy. I just that's, I just picked a cue. Uh, in, it said, in addition to its uh, functions in biological systems, quorum sensing has several useful applications for computing and robotics. In general, quorum sensing can function as a decision-making process in any decentralized system in which the components have a a means of assessing the number of other components they interact with, and B, a standard response once a threshold number of components is detected. So basically, you you, you can get some... Um, uh, insects use it, uh, mm. usually to decide where they're going to nest. They've all got to agree, uh, so they communicate with each other. Um, you're talking about ants, you're talking about honeybees, um yeah yeah that, that makes sense. i mean like that. they're all they're all the communicating term, with each other it's the term it. quorum then exactly yeah, you it have has more to be than a majority one. decision if you like yeah you can't have a quorum of one no exactly um uh, so in synthetic body quorum sensing has been engineered using synthetic biological circuits in different systems um examples include rewiring the ahl components of toxic genes to control population size in bacteria. But, uh, and then that goes on about other things you can do with, with bacteria. 
but also it's, as I said, it can be used in uh, computing and robotics and you can use it for um, swarms of drones, um, uh, which will communicate with each other and they can form whatever patterns they want and things like that, but they all have to agree. Mm. Um, so that's why now you're probably asking, why am I talking about quorum uh, sensing? Well, it's all to do with searching for ET. Oh, yeah. And the reason I brought it up is, of course, we've we've got this habit of sending messages out into space or uh, discs or, uh, you know, record discs and uh, plaques and things like that. And we're always assuming that these uh, intelligences that we will come across, um, whether or not they're going to understand what we've actually what we're trying to communicate to them. And as regards to this question has come up several times with SETI and things like that, mm. um, who are, are doing these, uh, these searches. And, uh, and it, of course, it, like I said, it came up. There's one time that, that we thought, well, how do you know that if a, a, an object is communicating within itself or with its others or its nearby neighbors, mm. how can you classify it as an intelligent life? And they all they did experiments using dolphins where they taught dolphins to respond to certain commands and also that dolphins to use clicks and buzzes and things like that to talk back to us to tell us what they're you know yeah. they're supposedly thinking hmm. but if if dolphins can understand us uh what we're saying to them we don't hear anybody talking dolphinese back to them true so we're not we're not talking to them as such um and the, the experiments went on and it came across, you know, as, as we already knew that the, you've got this uh, quorum sensing yeah. um, uh, between bacteria, but does that actually make bacteria intelligent? Because by switching on and off uh, different uh, systems, they can control the group, how big their colony is or whether to, uh, expand into another area or things like that and it was just um it was just something that came up um so uh, the, the question is does evidence of complex communication stand the test as evidence for higher intelligence does one have to be able to speak a language to be considered truly intelligent there are many examples of complex communication in nature such as honeybees wiggle dancing quorum sensing around uh, amongst bacteria mm -hmm. or the chemical um or the, sorry or the chemical signal uh, emitted by plants but nobody has ever accused a flower of being clever excuse me I'm i think you, you know i think you know th this is an old question <laughs> and i think we can talk maybe about awareness rather than intelligence yeah so, exactly an organism that is aware of itself and its surroundings, we refer to as, as a sentient being, but that doesn't necessarily indicate intelligence. It just indicates awareness. Now, if you're going to ask, where is the intersection of awareness and intelligence? Can you have awareness without intelligence? Uh, then that's a bit of a tricky one. But I would say that if you look at slime molds, for example, slime molds are, are capable of the most incredibly advanced behavior. And they're really simple, you know, uncomplicated, few celled life. But they can do the most amazing things. They can find the optimum route towards finding food, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and lots hey. of other amazing feats that you think, well, that, that is intelligence, you know. But. <laughs> We don't know. This is why, um, you know, they're flying or have already flown slime molds up to the International Space Station to give them puzzles and tests to complete challenges to see if they can do it in, in microgravity as well as they can on the Earth. Because slime molds are showing this that perhaps our definition of intelligence is far, far, far too narrow, that, you know, we're only used to one si type of intelligence and, um, and perhaps intelligence can exist in lots of different forms that we don't actually recognize at the moment. Yeah. Because um, yeah. it, it says here, I'll just finish this bit of um, bacteria, despite being uh, single celled mm. uh, in contravention of some of the evidence suggestions that life needs to be multi multicellular to have a degree of intelligence. 
um, are able to communicate in a sense by each sec secreting a molecule that once enough have accumulated triggers bacteria to behave in a certain way and en masse, as you mm -hmm. say. Um, consequently, populations of bacteria are able to track changes in their environment and vote. I don't know about the word vote. Let's put that in um, uh, inverted brackets. commas. Yeah. Uh, yeah, inverted commas on how to behave. Bacteria may be single celled, but th thanks to this quorum sensing, many working to to together can behave as one multicellular organism. So, as you said, yes, it's um, same as slime moths. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the same. exactly. So, uh, and ants, of course, is... with, with, with super colonies, you know, that, uh, with, with individual ants uh, creating a sort of hive mind, if you like. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, 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 that's what, and that's what they're thinking. And it's basically, they're just sort of like, it was, uh, the question was raised. We're sending out these signals. We're making lots of assumptions. We've said this before. Yes. That uh, every, everything's going to understand our type of physics and things mm. like that, mm. our language, what we know, what da da da. But then they thought, well, well hang about, you know, we've got all these organisms, all these creatures on, on the planet, which do act as an individual group, uh, as, mm. a, as, as individuals, but also can group together and work as one big organism yeah yeah um does that make it intelligent does make and, it intelligent, um, you know so where, we, where you get the behavior of, of of the many um out outshining the 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 behavior of the individual and doing things the individual mm. can't do but as a, as a as a colony as a host they can and that is amazing yeah. that is absolutely so amazing what they're saying is we, we've got to really be able to dis distinguish between well, I mean, what we would possibly call intelligence uh, may be completely different system mm. on another and we've world. Got to be able or to recognize like it. So we have to exactly. be able to. Because so we we've got to go destroying any happening. alien life if it's, yeah. if it's a form that we don't. I mean, this is the danger, isn't it? That, that we, our, our definitions of intelligence and what we're actually looking for in the universe may be so limited that we may inadvertently destroy something in the universe. Well, we, exactly. Ignorance. Yeah, or or again, as as I said, I think I've said before on some some of my um, because uh, I I love you know me I, I like a bit of seti and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I I like sofas as well. And stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, boom, boom. Um, but uh, boom, boom. <laughs> you know what I've written about your jokes. I know. <laughs> you haven't found that hit man yet, though. So I think I'm safe. <laughs> I'm not telling you if I am or not, yeah, but there must be there must be laws to stop this anyway. Um, we we I'm digress. Not stop it as well, you know. Yeah. So, but um, of course, just on, in going back, sort of like a few hundred years, and all, when we were exploring the seas for the first time and coming across yeah, indigenous peoples on islands and all that, that had totally different traditions, totally different mm. um, ways of behaving and things like that, and uh, you often led because we thought we were superior and we wanted to change these people and we didn't understand what they were thinking often led to violence and sometimes annihilation of complete indigenous people. So yeah, we've got to be uh, very, very careful. We um, have, we have. Uh, so uh, yes, so that is uh, quorum sense. Uh, quorum sensing. Yeah, quorum, very, quorum very sensing. interesting. Yes. You know, doubtless a subject we could talk about for hours yet because it's so yeah, interesting. We could do. Yeah. It's so interesting this whole business of sentience and intelligence yeah. and the rest of it. So there we are. Well, well I'm gonna move uh, to something more prosaic now, something we're we're more used to. And that is to say Q is for quadrantids, which is a meteor shower in <laughs> in uh, in January, it peaks in early January. And the radiance, that is to say, the point in the sky where the meteors appear to be coming from, is in the constellation of. Do you know where, where it is, Daz? Where the radiance of the quadrant is? Ooh, can I make a guess? Ooh, go on, go on. Booties? Very good. Booties. Yeah, very good. <laughs> I only know only because you've written about it already. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. I know you. Um, <laughs> I, I've always been um, a little uh, wary of pronouncing that word because I call it booties. Um, I've heard people call it boots because it's got yeah. norm because it's got normal out on the second though. It should more correctly be boetes. Boetes, yeah. Um, so, but booties is fine. It's cute. Yeah. Anyway, um, the the surprising thing about this particular meteor shower happens, you know, every January and it peaks in early January, is that the hourly rate can be as high as the Perseids or the Geminids. 
Uh, that is to say, you know, I think the Perseids is given as an average about what, 60 or 70 meteors an hour. Mm-hmm. And the Gemini's, I think, are similar. But um, the problem is that the the peak of the quadrant is the time frame is exceptionally short. short it's just yeah. a few hours. Whereas with something like the Perseids, it starts, you know, mid-August and then, well, sorry, early August and then goes up to, you know, late 20s August where you, you're probably guaranteed to see at least one. Um, the, the, the quadrantids have a, a peak of only a few hours. And also another thing that people, people don't really see them is because they're very faint and they, their apparent magnitudes go from uh, three to six. So they're, you know, they're not bright meteors, although there are a lot of them. And of course, if you've got any moon at all, you're not going to see something between magnitude three and six very much. Um, so, you know, that peak um, means that those meteors reach one half of their highest value for only yeah. about eight hours. Um, and, you know, the, the real peak of the Perseids, for example, is two days. So it's, it's a fraction of it. And um, they've actually dated uh, the material in the quadrantids, and it's only about 500 years old. So it's, it's whatever body it comes from um, it, that has material that's been ejected or left or whatever within the last 500 years. And it was tentatively, the, the parent body of the quadrant is, was tentatively identified by Peter Jeniskins in uh, 2003 as minor planet 2003 EH1, but also... There's some. There's a comet related to that particular minor planet. It may the comet may actually be a, a chunk of that minor planet, and that comet is C one four nine zero Y one. And this comet was observed about five hundred years ago by Chinese, Japanese, and Korean astronomers. So that sort of ties in with with uh, with the, the timeline really. Uh, so we. You know, the, the definitive origin of the material in the quadrant is Michelle hasn't been positively identified, but it begins to look as if associated with that minor yeah. planet and that comet. Mm. So, so there we are. And uh, the material is quite fine and never produces uh, any fireballs or, or anything like that. And the, the meteors are faint. But if, you know, January is a good time to go out under the stars, as we know, because it, you, you're more likely to get clear skies, if not cold skies, in January. So in early January, you know, it's worth going out and having a look and seeing material that has originated from um, this minor planet and or this this comet. So there you are. So that's the yeah, question for you. As you said, it's very, very early. In, it's sort of like, is it the 3rd to the 6th? Um, third, something like that in January, yeah. yeah the 3rd to yeah. the 6th of January. Yeah, so it's, and as you it's, said, it's very sh- short-lived. Yeah, very um, short-lived. Whereas we can have weeks on the the, the other um, yeah um, yeah showers, you've just got hours with this, and of course contradits contra contradits um, is actually named after an obsolete constellation. Yes, that's right. Um, it is. And so that's how it, they got their name. The quadrant. But then when the um, you know the International Astronomical Union decided to change things up mm. uh, and have only eighty eight, uh, the quad whatever it was, the quadrant or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, was taken out of it. So it, um, but that's how it's got it got its name. It was the um, it was the quadrant, wasn't it? As in the the seafarers quadrant. Yeah, or, but possibly. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 it sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's right. That's but, what it was um, named after. Yeah. But then it was um, put into uh, booties or boteas or whatever. And, again, of course, the other thing about it is that we, we know the Perseids. The Perseids is the most famous annual meteor shower. And it's not necessarily the best. The Geminids are quite often more spectacular mm. than the Perseids, although the Perseids do generate more fireballs than the Geminids do. Yeah. Um, but, of course, the Perseids occur in the middle of summer when people can stay up all night looking for meteors because it's warm yeah. enough. You know, and, and people, far fewer people are going to be outside in January to witness the, the quadranted shower, uh, yeah, unless they're like, like us and mad astronomers <laughs> who, you know, yeah. are completely immune to any effects of cold. Uh, so, um, you know, but uh, the Perseus is famous because it occurs in the summer months and you get some lovely fireballs. And yeah, I've certainly seen this some year, lovely this year. fireballs. Because this year there was um, uh, an extraordinarily a large amount of fireballs associated. Yeah, there with, was. Uh, 
Oh, actually, talking of that, reading today, last weekend over America, they had five enormous fireballs in 14 hours. Yeah, I heard something that's also yeah. down in Chile. They've had a, a very um, high rate of fireballs, mm. um, and they're not sure where they've come from. No. Um, they're not sure yeah. whether they were man-made objects re-entering or... Mm. or well, the, um, the, one, the ones in the States have, have been positively identified as fireballs. The majority were caught on okay. camera. And uh, there's one over South Carolina that was really spectacular. It's a really big fireball as well. And there was one in, uh, which country was it? Somewhere in Eastern Europe. Do forgive me, I can't remember where. Mm. Somewhere in Eastern Europe. Big, big, big um, fireball. And they managed to find fragments of it simply by triangulating from footage mm. from dashboard cams. Yeah, I saw that one. Yeah. yeah, and they managed um, to recover fragments from, from doing some yeah. tri- triangulation from the videos, and, and which led them exactly to where the, 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 the fireball had come down. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's something weird going on because yeah, because th- there was a fireball caught. Um, it was a seaside town, and again, I can't remember where it was. It was I think it was down south. Um, and on a dashboard cam in broad daylight, a fireball was broad caught daylight. streaking across yeah, in daylight. Yeah, I've only ever um, seen one of those in broad daylight. Yeah, it was. Um, mm. uh, that was only in the news, I think, this week. Um, and they had photographs. Well, they know they'd taken stills mm. from the. Um, the dash cam and all that, and yet, and there's definitely a, a big fireball coming across. And, and la- last day, night, somebody uh, from Astronomy Island on Facebook reported a large fireball, and then a couple of other people mm. said they've seen it as well. So it does appear that we're going through a, an abnormally high excess of fireballs at the moment. Yeah. Whether just this is just a war- statistical blip, who knows? Yeah, just remember how War of the Worlds started. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We'll get oh, which which right War of the anyway. Worlds? I mean, you've got to, because the, the Tom Cruise one, uh, was starts, uh, which was, well, I like the film actually, but the premise was ridiculous no. that, that um, aliens came to Earth in, in bolts of lightning to yeah. then burrow into the Earth to recover the tripod machines that they buried there previously that nobody knew was nobody there knew, but, yeah. uh, for millions of years or so oh, it was it was ridiculous it was well, a good film, that, good film yeah I, I enjoyed the effects and stuff like that yeah. um I, i'm not a great fan of tom cruise no no um, me neither. but um it was the way it ended um it was just a sudden you know yeah yeah a sudden ending mm. and there was it was going on quite nicely, and of course, you had him where he had to deal but with that's the. That's how the book the ended. As the, the book yeah. ends with, with the Martians being defeated by earthly. Uh, oh yeah, there, there was that, but it was, it's the way they they did it for right, some reason. It was just a too much of a cut off. It was yeah. just um because of course you had the red weed and you had all that. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, red weed. Um, and um, <laughs> you uh, uh but uh, the way it just sort of like cut off. Um. Uh, I was a little bit disappointed. It it didn't fit with me. So uh, right. maybe I'm just being, you know, no, okay. uh, pedantic. I don't know. So, um, but actually, that could lead us into. Have you finished with um? Yes, that's that's uh, the so quadrant. Didn't is want be, yes. Yeah, didn't want to be. I was going to do something else, but it will bring me into, um, nicely because we're talking about science fiction, and uh, no doubt you will remember. Can you remember Quatermass? Oh, how Quatermass. could I forget? Quatermass. Now, yeah. the earliest Quatermass I can remember, I think yeah. it's probably going to be the film of Quatermass and the Pit. Yeah, well, this the one I can remember. Well, I, I can remember two. Uh, and yes, in the Quatermass and the Pit and was the one I can remember. Mm. Um, now, for those who are, are not aware, it was a BBC series um it was written by nigel keneal or neil i don't think you pronounce <laughs> it okay. um keneal <laughs> Irish. um and the one as you said with quite a mass in the pit that's the one where they discover a uh an space alien vehicle. spaceship yeah. yeah yeah and um and again, that's Mars. That, that those creatures were considered to come from Mars. That's right. And there's there's a, a chap who's who's in there and he's working on it. Some general builder, 
and he gets somehow influenced by this magnetic thing going on oh, and he turns into film. this brilliant. little creature thing and all that brilliant. and of brilliant. course i watched it all in black and white now i think it was in color but i think it was just a case that we had a black and white telly uh, the ditto um, yes yes i remember it was, being in black and white but but it was obviously filmed in color yeah and it was basically the morris people trying to um save their themselves because they they'd outgrown mars as a planet mm. and they uh, used all the resources and things like that so they had to move out and they came to england but um yes it was mr mr quatermass it was a bbc television science fiction series um they started as far back as, as the 50s the mid 50s they were yeah. they were first made um and it spawned off some um uh, side shoots and all that uh, you had Quater, as we said, Quatermass in the pit. You had the Quatermass experiment. Mm. Uh, you had Quatermass two, which yeah. followed on from That's Quatermass. That's a good movie. That's a good movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was, uh, there have been uh, remakes, uh, and there was one made, and I can remember this one as well, um, back in 1979. With John which Mills. Was just the, was, uh, yes, with John Mills. Yeah, I remember um, that. The standard uh, uh, Quatermass story. Mm. Um, and it was basically at the time I, I can remember watching them and not fully understanding what was going on because when I first saw them, I was really was young. Yeah. Um, and uh, of course, not being into uh, space and things like that, but I found them fascinating, but also quite frightening. Yeah. Uh, at the time, I can remember that it was like Doctor Who with the Daleks and things like that. Well, when you're very young, was, you don't know. You know when um, when you and I were young. Um, these programs would have been on the evening and we certainly wouldn't have yeah. been up in the evening to watch them. Yeah. Uh, or highly unlikely to. Um, so, you know, this is why I don't remember the original Crater Mass, even though it was on, well, the original was, was the late fifties. And, um, and I think Crater Mass two was a few years later when I was very young. Yeah. Well, the, most of these were um, first sh- uh, broadcast before we were born. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, um, so it's it's it, it, they they were very advanced for what they were at the time, mm. um, but also they some of them were sort of um, associated with what was happening at the time. Um, there's one I think it's the Quater Mass. Uh, let me think. Experiment where yes, uh, aliens come down and they uh, invade people's bodies, and what they're after is to get hold of the nuclear weapons and to so cause right. nuclear accidents That's and things right. like yeah, that. Yeah. I yeah. think that think that was the experiment. Oh well, no, what, that, no, was, sorry, that, was was, Quatermass, that was Quatermass two. The Quatermass yeah, right, experiment yeah. was was the astronaut that astronauts. Came that's right. Yeah, space, uh, space turned, ship and turn into an alien. Um, and that yeah, was actually, two or two uh, of the crew were already because if you listen to you know older people than, than ourselves, uh, they'll tell you how scary that was. And you look at it now, and actually the special effects have stood the test of time remarkably well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, but you know, black and white television on the BBC in those days, uh, it must have been very scary because I, I always thought the Daleks were much scarier in black and white than they ever yeah. were in color. Yeah. Um, and I, I used to sit behind the sofa with a cardboard box over my head when that was on, I tell you, and uh, yeah. you know, I was 21 <laughs> at the time. No, uh, no, seriously, my parents always laugh about, you know, when yeah. the Daleks were on, I would insist on sitting behind the sofa with a cardboard yeah. box on my head. So and I then, you had, it. then yeah. you had the cyber bed and then yeah, they were, the they, were that that scary. they were still pretty no. creepy though, but yeah, but, but you know, if you notice how they've all the, Sorry, when they were shot in black and white, you know, black and white has that thing, you know, the color just doesn't that that yeah. is scary, that we associate yeah. with sort of. But have, have you things. seen the, the development of the uh, the Cybermen? And now they're oh, all joke. ripped with six packs and things like that. I know, um, and and, and those before... stupid multicolored Daleks that they brought out, yeah, uh, you know, a few years ago that was so obviously aimed at just merchandising yeah. it, you know, and selling yeah. these these plastic Daleks of garish colors it was rid- no self-respecting dalek would have ever been seen with a bright blue paint job i mean you know <laughs> they come out saying exterminate and then they say can you come and do some interior design for me you well, know right, it's, yeah. just, it's just ridiculous anyway there, there was no sorry. pink ones there was no pink ones but no. yeah it's um it's because, I don't about, know. Um, about crater mass um crater mass was a, a strange name for a scientist but nigel neil got it 
he was looking for a name for a scientist and he literally stuck his finger in the phone book and it landed on Quatermass that he had living a guy uh, in the phone book where he lived it was in the phone book. And he said, oh, Quatermass, oh, that sounds good. And then, of course, he needed a first name and it had to be Bernard, of course. So Bernard Quatermass, yeah, who was very yeah. much um, a, a, a bit of a rebel scientist. He was always getting into trouble with authority and nobody was ever believing mm. him when he was telling them that there were dire things coming from the skies. And, um, you know, he was up against the stiff upper lip British establishment a lot of the time, but was always proved right in the end, of course, because he was a he was a wonderful scientist. He was the hero. And knew his stuff. And even when he came up against that horrible Colonel Bream in in Quatermass and the pit, uh, who believed that the alien spaceship that they found in the tube station was a was a German, an unknown German V weapon. Mm. Um, So, you know, he was always arguing with authority. But a forerunner of uh, things like Doomwatch as well. Doomwatch yeah, had the right. same. Yeah, story. I remember that. Yeah, uh, um, because sort of Qua- the, the Quatermass was actually over four series. Of, of looking at what I've got here. Oh right. Um, I could read you the story because it's all list- listed out. So you had the Quatermass but... experiment, Quatermass two, Quatermass and the Pit, and then mm. the the final one with John Mills. Is that right? Um, well, Quatermass was the original one. Um, yeah. Uh, but it was remade with John Mills in 1979. Yes. Um, and sometimes it's called Quatermass 4 or something like that, because there's right. been about four or five different stories. But the, the reason it ended is Miss, basically John uh, John Neal got um, bored of it. Um, yes. He can, and he went on to do bigger and b- better things. They have tried to draw, drag him back several times, but yes. they never came to anything. But he also um, did some, uh, some other memorable stuff from the BBC. There's one called mm. The Stone Tapes that he did. Yeah. There was another right, one yeah. called The Year of the Sex Olympics, which he did. That's it. Yeah. Um, which I, I thought was, you know, how the Are hell... you reading it... my notes? No, my sorry, shoulder. sorry. No, yeah, I should let you speak. <laughs> no, you sorry, carry no, on. Sorry, no, I'm, you... I'm, I'm no, no, on. carry on, because I'm glad you know there's somebody else who remembers the Quatermass <laughs> right, um, okay. things. But the, the basic story of this one was that uh, John Mills, who is retired and he's living up in Scotland, um, he travels to London because his um, uh, his granddaughter's gone missing. Mm. And when he when he gets there, he finds that the, basically the world is going to pot in a handcart, um, and it's uh, run down, uh, full of crime, um, and things like that. And he's finding that a lot of people are turning to um, cults. Mm. Um, and they're all gathering around um, places like Stonehenge or anywhere else which has ancient connotations with it and all that. That's, that's fairly normal stuff, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. We call it, well, they call them. <laughs> we the see that all the years. time. <laughs> a load of, load of um, Stonehenge. <laughs> but in his, in his search for her, um, he, comes, he comes across these, you know, other units. He gets attacked and things like mm. that and gets injured. Um, but in the end, uh, he realizes that there's something more, uh, because what happens is these people that a bright light is seen and people tend to disappear. Um, and it, 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 he makes his way to Stonehenge where all these people are gathering. Mm. He's realized that it's aliens that are the, the cause of it. Um, and he uh, gets a bomb. And when the light comes, he also, when he gets to Stonehenge, he sees his granddaughter who recognizes him. Um, but to, to see her there, he gives him a heart attack and, but they've got to explode the bomb when the light comes down because people That's basically right. turned to dust and were sucked up and yeah. it was the aliens harvesting humans. humans. Uh, yeah, for their right. well, um, and in the end, the last scene is he detonates the bomb, the, the bomb by hand. That's right. Uh, with it's his bright flash and, and that's it. Yeah. And then the punchline is, is they must have learned their, the aliens must have learned their lesson and got the message because they never came back. Back, yeah. Um, all these can be found online. You, you can still get them on DVD. Yes, indeed. Um, yes, and things like that. And I'm definitely going to go back and have a look at them. You've got some on YouTube as well. Um, I've, still yes. got my, I've still got my VHS of Crater Mass and the Pit somewhere. So. Yeah, so that, that's it. It says it was uh, released on VHS and... Mm. Uh, Mm. Was that the older or the newer one? Um, but yes, it uh... that was that. Uh, Quite a mass on the pit. Funnily enough, nineteen sixty-seven. It was made by Hammer. It was a Hammer. Yeah, horror, that's right. Yeah, uh, which was their, I think, their only deviation into sort of straight science fiction instead of horror. 
And it was quite, it was successful at the box office. So, um, but they never repeated that experiment. Yes, because again, that was Nigel Neal. He was involved with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Quatermass 4 was the, what uh, the Quatermass became to be known That's as. Right. That's uh, right. Which was a four part serial um, yeah. uh, filmed at a later date. But yes, it was, it was a fascinating, at the time, it was on the ball. Uh, it had social connotations assigned with it. Um, again, because with the, the one with the nuclear, the, the aliens trying to get hold of the nuclear yeah, bombs. absolutely. Was, you know, in line with what was happening in the real world. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, and it was yes, very, it, I mean, it was, you can't underestimate how popular it was. Everybody watched yeah. Quatermass. My, my parents used to tell me how, you know, everybody they knew was absolutely glued to watching Quatermass. Yeah, that's what everybody was talking about the day. That's the right. Day. That's right. Nowadays, it's East Enders. Yeah, nowadays it's East Enders, but in those days it was Quatermass. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah how quite, far yeah, we yeah, East, Quatermass was believable, but East Enders isn't. <laughs> <laughs> and on that bombshell, listeners, I'm afraid time has got the, the, yeah. the best of us again. So thank you, Daz. That was, that was great, as always. Yeah, uh, yeah, we, we, we conquered Q, which was the one we thought we would have problems with. Yeah. Uh, but we've, we, uh, we've managed to find uh, some interesting material there, I think. So yes, next yeah. week, we're on to the letter R, and uh, I'm sure we're going to find that a little easier to, to present to you. P, the kicking P. Yes. Uh, so um, <laughs> the kicking P, as Daz says. So have a great week. Uh, take care of each other. Stay safe. And uh, we'll be along soon before you know it with uh, a further foray into the vast savanna of well, the astronomical alphabet. So it's yeah. good, good night from me and it's good night from Daz. Yes, thank you. And I uh, hope you enjoyed, uh, enjoyed yourselves and listen, enjoyed listening to this. Uh, everybody, please stay safe and look after each other.